Welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is April the 10th, 2014. Welcome to any new listeners to Truth Sentinel, uh, thanks to existing ones. Uh, Truth Sentinel is on the move this week. Uh, we came through the Netherlands from the UK. Uh, we went through Turkey, through Istanbul, Ankara. Now we're in Odessa, Ukraine to do some reporting on the ground. Um, uh, at the moment, everything seems fairly normal here. Um, it's pretty much how I remember it. People are still going to cafes, going to bars. Um, I went for a walk along the sea the other day by the beach and um, everything seemed fairly normal. I did hear a couple of military jets go over uh, this morning. Not sure what that was about. That could be anything. Um, and this evening in Odessa, there was some kind of celebration about some kind of past military occurrence. I'm not entirely sure what it was, but um, it basically involved loads and loads of fireworks and bangs. And at one stage, I, it was so loud and they didn't sound like fireworks anymore. I actually thought they, uh, that Putin had used this as an opportunity to attack because it did sound extremely loud, but thankfully it stopped at the moment. But if you do hear any bangs later, that's what it's about, basically. There's some kind of uh, commemoration going on this evening in Odessa. Anyway, today's news. Uh, in Ukraine, Russian troops are still on the border, and um, they've been given a... Uh, the, there's also Russian pro-activists um, that have been given a 48-hour ultimatum uh, by Arsen Avakov. Basically, they need to get out of the buildings they've occupied or face force. That was about 24 hours ago, so uh, maybe that military jet was just a, a practice run, and then maybe in, a, in 24 hours we're going to see something happen. It remains to be seen anyway. Putin's also warned Europe of gas shortages over the Ukraine situation because Ukraine hasn't paid their debts at the moment. So he's basically hinting that um, the EU should give them money so they can pay the, the gas bill. Tensions have been high, basically, since the government buildings in the eastern cities of Lugansk, uh, Donetsk and Kharkiv were taken over on Sunday. Other news, Oscar Pistorius' trial continues with Oscar being cross-examined a bit more um, thoroughly uh, by uh, the prosecution. I still don't quite understand his version of events. I think I, I would check if my girlfriend um, was in the toilet before I'd, I'd started shooting uh, through the door. It doesn't make sense, his story at the moment. Um, we're not going to cover it too much because it's not really a conspiracy, uh, but you know we comment on, on all the news anyway, but just seems strange. He said that he's, he's actually saying now that he turned round to her and said, uh, call the police. But if, if you turn around somewhere, you just check whether you're talking to someone, you'd probably wait for a response. It all seems very um, dubious to me. What do you think about that anyway? Um, the search for the MH370 continues. And, and now, rather than the debris, which they seem to have given up on looking for, despite these previous... Um, mentions of 25 meter long objects it's now focusing on the jet signal uh, saying yeah we think we heard something oh we think we've heard something else it, it really does it does seem extremely strange to me that for the last few weeks there's pretty much been nothing found and and no more news has come out every it's all speculation we've and we obviously done a bit of that ourselves but it's a very peculiar case i think and it remains to see what's going to happen about it. Last week we talked to you about Diego Garcia. That's just one of the many theories as to what happened to that plane. Who knows? But I don't. I think at this stage I could. I would say I don't buy the story. There, there's some kind of cover up, or there's something going on. Um, what do you think about that, anyway? Um, Prince George is starting his new life under the sanitised royal microscope of the press in the same week that Prince Andrew, Andrew was linked with sex scandals involving young girls. The Daily Mail said they're in no way suggesting he's involved, despite the girl in question saying yes, he, he knew what was going on for sure. It's the usual whitewash of anything involving royals. They couldn't possibly do anything wrong and they're completely protected by the press. They could literally get away with murder, and when I say literally, I think they could, because I don't think the Queen could be prosecuted for any crime. 
Uh, check that out if you don't, if you're not, if you don't believe me. I don't think she's actually. Um, I think she may be immune to prosecution. Princess Anne was saying this week. Uh, she said that it's much kinder because there's a there's a possible badger cull coming on. There seems to be so many culls uh, mentioned in the news lately. I'm not sure what that's about. But anyway, um, she's saying um, it's much kinder to gas badgers than to shoot them. She's such a, she's such a, sh a softy, really. Yeah, she's saying it's much much kinder. Um, probably a view shared by her Nazi father, actually, um, Prince Philip. Um, who would love to, love to exterminate most of the human race, which is a, a plague on the earth, in his words. As the balance of power in Asia swings towards China, Japan has started building one of the most modern and powerful naval forces in the world. Um, I mean, after the World War II, the, the US imposed a settlement on Japan, basically saying that it couldn't build a very big army anymore. But it looks like it's, um, it's ignoring that. I guess in some ways you can't blame them um, with what's going on in the world, basically. Maria Miller, a British MP, quits an expenses scandal. Yet another MP using taxpayers' money to fund fund her lifestyle. It's, um, I mean, basically, MP, our MPs in the UK um, have so many things they can claim on expenses that they don't have to actually spend any money. They can claim for taxis, for trains, um, homes, second homes food, entertainments, it's no wonder they're out of touch with normal people really because even you know, if we could claim all that then we wouldn't, we'd have no worries either and uh, so they shouldn't basically be making laws when they're not living the same lifestyle they don't understand how normal people are living I read on the BBC website today that um, the human species may, may split into two basically and evol evolutionary theorist Oliver Curry from the London School of Economics said that he thinks that there's going to be two types of humans there's going to be the um the upper class who will be uh, educated good looking tall slim uh, creative and intelligent of course um, and then there's going to be an underclass of humans who will be dim-witted ugly squat gobbling like creatures these are his words I think I've seen some of those on the London Underground. If you go if you go out on the London Underground about half eleven, you'll see some of those kind of people. Anyway, apparently this isn't going to happen for until the year three thousand, so we've got some time yet. Anyway, before we have to worry too much. Uh, tragically, there was also the mysterious death of Peaches Geldof, uh, yet another death of someone so young connected to the world of music, film, or media, and her death at the moment is still unexplained. There was a mass stabbing at a U.S. high school. Up to 20 students were hurt in a stabbing at a school near the U.S. city of Pittsburgh. And a suspect thought to be a student is in custody. It's quite strange that um, usually when you hear of uh, sort of mass attempted murders in, in, in the U.S., it's usually guns. Quite strange that it was a knife because you would have thought that... Um, they would have used a, a gun if they wanted to seriously wanted to commit harm. But anyway, a lot of people were seriously injured in this attack. More, more to come out about that, I would imagine, in the in the coming week. On the BBC website, there's been a lot of um, talk about the public being urged to reset all their passwords by tech firms such as Yahoo because of some kind of heartbleed bug. Uh, security uh, security bug basically causing havoc online, um, meaning criminals could access passwords for um, a lot of different types of websites. And then there was another article on the BBC basically saying that maybe it's time to get rid of passwords and that we should use these edible electronic capsules instead. You can't help wondering whether the the media is just totally trying to manipulate people. Um, I mean, we already know, as I've said before, that a lot of our um, prime ministers and, and MPs are good friends with the media. So it's um, it wouldn't be completely uh, unlikely that they're, they're having, they have agendas that they're trying to get across in the media. Um, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, has backed talks with world powers um, 
basically talking about their uh, nuclear program, but he's warned that they're not intending to give up their nuclear program at all. And it is hypocritical of Western governments to say other countries can't have them. Uh, it's okay for us to have them, but you can't have them. I mean, but surely it's better to lead by example. Everyone should get rid of them. The US should get rid of their nuclear weapons. The UK should get rid of their nuclear weapons. Then they can turn around to other countries and say, yeah, you, can't, you shouldn't have them either. And that would be fair enough. Uh, in my opinion, um, nuclear weapons should be illegal. In, in, I mean, we don't need them, basically. Look what they do. Do we want to do that to anyone? I mean, I, w I told you about when I visited the um, Hiroshima Museum in Japan and I met a um, survivor from the uh, Hiroshima bombing all those years ago. And uh, she was still shaking with fear, just, just trying to describe what happened. And the reason she was putting herself through that was because she wanted to try to get across that it should never happen again. And I think she's right. And I think as part of our education program in schools, we should make sure that children have to visit Hiroshima and Auschwitz and all the things that represent the mistakes of the past and make sure they don't happen again. Because I think they will happen again because nobody's doing anything to stop it. So in last episode, we did talk about Malaysia Flight 370 and Diego Garcia. We weren't saying necessarily the plane was there. We just thought it'd be, um, be interesting to get a bit more background detail on Diego Garcia. And we discovered that Diego Gar Garcia had allegations that it was turning into a kind of secret Guantanamo Bay, Bay style base, that, that um, people were outsourcing torture uh, um, to an interrogation to that island. And... Um, Basically, at some point we want to contact, we want to get back in contact with um, with Anthony and see what he's looking at this week. I did have a chance to say a quick hello to him when I passed through Ankara the other day. So uh, let's just listen to that quick conversation I had with Anthony when I was in Ankara. Okay, I'm here in Ankara, Turkey, um, doing some uh, interviews with... Uh, people on the ground, not only in Turkey, there probably won't be much opportunity to speak to too many in Turkey because I'm off to Odessa, Ukraine um, in some a couple of hours. But I'm, uh, I'm here with one of our academic researchers, our resident academic researcher, Anthony. So I thought I'd say, um, take the opportunity to say hello and find out what, what, um, what sort of things he might be researching at the moment in for upcoming programs. Hello, Anthony. Hi, welcome to Ankara. Thank you very much, and, and what a nice place it is. Yeah, nice little quiet area of town. That's, yeah. um, you, do you live uh, in this area, or do you live nearby? What, what can you tell us about this, the area you live in? Uh, yeah, no, I live on campus at uh, Bill Kent University, which uh, is mostly known for engineering and social sciences, and it's a little way out of town, so yeah, this is not my backyard. And do you usually go into town? You mentioned you've talked to us before about um, some of the protests going on. Have you actually come across them or, or stumbled stumbled into them while, while you've been walking about town? I've been near a few. I haven't been in any. <laughs> uh, it's, some, it's the kind of thing that you, you can run into from time to time. Uh, and there are parts of town where it's just a regular occurrence and you, you just know, okay, don't go there at, at night if you don't want to taste the tear gas, you know. Yeah, nobody likes the taste of tear gas, as far as I know. Um, so, what kind of things are you researching at the moment for Truth Sentinel? Well, uh, I have a long-standing interest in uh, experimental music that kind of pushes the frontiers, I suppose you could say, of sound and what's possible to do with sound. Uh, and some decades ago, uh, some of these musicians slash researchers hit upon uh, a way of producing sound outside of audible frequencies and they found that this, these sounds could have significant physical effects. Now this has uh, over time caught on and become increasingly weaponized and we've seen many examples of it uh, in the past say five years in America and Japan. Uh, so I'm just going to be looking into uh, the state of uh, sonic weaponry uh, at the moment and the possible future of that. Uh, the scariest example that I know of at the moment is uh, Japanese whaling companies using this against protesters. So they'll 
they will immobilize the crew of uh, vessels um, that are that are captained by by protest organizations. They'll immobilize them using sound and then destroy those vessels. But it's also being used extensively in the U.S. by law enforcement. So I'll just have a look into that uh, over the coming week, and I'll let you know what I find out. I'm hoping to uh, talk to at least one or two of the musicians who pioneered the field and find out what they think about it as well. Okay, sounds interesting. I, yeah, I heard in um, New York they've been using some kind of sonic cannon, and in Chicago too. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, the system is called uh, LRAD, Long Range Audio Device, um, and it's been used, for example, uh, in New York uh, during the Occupy protests there. It was used to disperse the crowd, but the long-term effects on the people who were involved in that incident are not yet known. Uh, it's thought that, that ultimately those people could suffer hearing damage and, and other uh, inner ear problems. Okay. Another thing I noticed when I when I was in uh, whilst I've been in Turkey, I've only been here a short time, but whenever I've, I've tried to go on YouTube, um, everything seems to be blocked. Um, can you tell me why why is YouTube blocked in Turkey at the moment? Well, the specific thing which set that off was uh, a conversation which was leaked uh, regarding what seems to be a planned invasion of Syria, uh, not the whole country, but certain. Uh, territories within Syria that, according to the participants of this conversation, uh, these were high-level politicians, high-level members of the ruling government, uh, according to these people, um, they're considering annexation. Now, this was this conversation was leaked on YouTube, and the government's response was to shut YouTube down, though they have threatened to do that before for different reasons uh, connected to political activism and so on. So I think this. This has been uh, the Turkish government versus YouTube has been going on for a little while. Yeah, it does. Seem, it seems strange to me that they would shut down, say, YouTube when people can just use other methods like other channels, like you know, Google, Facebook, or any other kind of video sharing channels. Um, so it just seems strange to me. Yeah, I think it's it's quite short-sighted, and other governments have have been guilty of this too. Uh, you see in the response of these governments a, a lack of understanding of, of new media. Uh, so I don't think that the Turkish government's um, shutting down of YouTube is going to either win them any friends or achieve the ends that they're hoping it will achieve. But, but we'll see what happens in the coming months. Have any of your students uh, mentioned this uh, at the university where you are? Or, or is YouTube available at your university? It is actually available at my university, and, and uh, the politics of Turkey are very unusual in that way. That a university, an established one uh, like mine, can, uh, I suppose, with the right connections, uh, find a way around these laws such that uh, our students can come to university and access sites that aren't accessible elsewhere in Turkey, like Twitter and YouTube. Okay, thank you. And um, thanks for talking to us today. We may um we may hear more from you later in this episode or or we may hear from you in an upcoming episode. Okay, thanks very much and have fun in Ukraine. Say hi to Odessa for me. Will do, thank you. Okay, um I wanted to talk a little bit about a government uh, government assassins because someone mentioned that on the comment section of Truth Sentinel. Um so do they exist? Well, I told you about the um the government assassin I met uh, when I was in Georgia who broke down crying and I, and I really believe he was telling the truth because he wasn't the kind of guy to cry at all. Um and he was basically really regretted what he'd done. Um but anyway, um, I did a little bit of research on um, government assassins and um, we know that there's snipers who serve in the army or in the marines, certain members of the special forces who may be trained in combat techniques. But um, how about actual assassins who have to go out and kill, um, kill important people or politicians or people like that? Apparently, there were uh, CIA, op CIA operatives with top-level security um, clearances 
that were trained as snipers or martial arts experts and um, basically a lot of their activities were generally kept secret and might not have even been recorded at all especially in the post 9-11 era apparently President Bush uh, gave the CIA permission to create an assassination unit and um, part of their job was to find and kill Al-Qaeda operatives and that was um, apparently run by the private security firm Blackwater they at least helped run it anyway and Bush wasn't completely um, involved in the decision-making cycle so that he could shield himself if um, anything went wrong or if any of it uh, was found to be illegal it allegedly began in 2001 um, and basically uh, some of some information has come to light because of a the testimony of a former US Navy SEAL uh, who gave some accounts of what he had to do and Dick Cheney was apparently involved as well when is he when he was Secretary of Defense for Bush during, uh, from 1989 to 1993 but as well as the more recent stuff, I mean, it could go back as far as the 60s and include the assassination of JFK, depending on what you're prepared to believe. And, you know, how, how far do these uh, assassinations go? Do, do they just involve political leaders um, or do they involve conspiracy theorists, for example? I mean, there have been cases of um, people who try to delve deeper into some conspiracy stories. And then, uh, you know, you might hear them on somewhere like Coast to Coast. Um, and a couple of week, weeks later, they're found dead with, um, and I'm thinking of one case where the, the entire family was dead, including the dog, um, daughters as well. And it was extremely unlikely this guy would do it to himself. So there's, who, who's actually committing those, those murders? I mean, let's look at the definition, definition of the word assassinate. It means murder an important person for political or religious reasons. Um... But I think the actual definition of, of assassin, uh, an assassination has changed over the years and can mean, can mean all kinds of things. Basically, originally, the, the, the original assassins derived their name from the Ara Arabic hashishim, or eaters of hashish, referring to the marijuana they consumed, apparently, for ritual purposes. Um, you would have thought that um, if they were smoking marijuana, they, they would have... Um, they wouldn't have had the motivation to go out and kill people, but apparently not, they did. They waged an international war of terrorism against anyone that opposed them. But they eventually turned on each other, a bit like in a Tarantino movie, I guess. In uh, 1250 AD, the conquering Mongols uh, were led by Mangu Khan. Um, and they actually almost annihilated the assassins. Um, some of them survived, though. And um, one group were led by an imam called Aga Khan, who I'm sure you may have heard of. Uh, or at least you've heard of one of them, because there seems to be quite a few of the Aga Khans. Moved from uh, Iran to India in 1840. His follow followers, um, who were supposed to have um, numbered in the millions, are still found in Syria, Iran and Central and South Asia. Uh, the largest groups uh, being in pa India and Pakistan, apparently known as the Kojas there. It does seem like everything goes around full circle. And if you start to um, investigate and research topics, you, you find that you're, you're dealing with, with areas that are still involved in the news currently, which are predominantly in the news, um, places like Syria. Aga Khan II came to be one of the founders of the Muslim League, which was sponsored by the British in 1858. The 48th Imam, Sir Sultan Mohammed Shah Aga Khan III, was very close, close to the British royal family. So this is what I mean. You start to investigate things and you realise that this, all the same people are involved. Um, the 49th Imam, Prince Karim Aga Khan IV, was given the British title His Highness by Queen Elizabeth II in 1957. So here she being mentioned as well. And continues to this day. And he, apparently he's closely allied to the Illuminati, who I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, 
We hear a lot about the Illuminati, but I wonder who are we talking about? Are we talking about a particular secret society called the Illuminati? Are we um, a bit like Al-Qaeda talking about certain groups or secret societies that have affiliations or or have connections to the in their roots to the Illuminati? Anyway, the Illuminati means one who is illuminated or an enlightened one. Um, the, Illum the Illuminati was founded by Adam, and sorry for my pronunciation, but it, um, it looks like Weishaupt, uh, 1748 to 1830. Um, that's that's when um, Adam was alive. Uh, his he died in 1830. It was very popular at first, the Illuminati, and it had about 2,000 members throughout Germany, France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Poland. Uh, Hungary and Italy and um, basically it's it's said that the Napoleonic Wars um, were started by the Illuminati so that the Illuminati actually start wars now if, if the Illuminati deals still do exist then maybe maybe they control wars now and I do believe that a lot of the wars that we see happening or about to happen around us are controlled by someone they're not just happening uh, according to the things that we see in the news. They're happening because someone's planned them. That's my, my opinion. What do you think about that? Do you think war, these wars are happening because of the events we see in the news? Or do you think they're being planned? Um, an interesting thing um, I discovered was that the Russian government have always been seen as an adversary to the Illuminati agenda. And perhaps still do to this day. That's why we've got the Russians on one side and the, and Europe and the US on another. Um, they've always seemed to have been adversary to the Illuminati. I'm sure we'll be talking about the Illuminati more in detail at some point on Truth Central, but I thought I'd just sort of um, basically investigate topics a little, little by little, so find out a bit more uh, each time. So we'll come back to the Illuminati anymore. And, and we, we may... Um, we're basically on, on Truth Sentinel, we'll get experts in, but we'll also just interview and speak to normal members of the public. Because I, th I really want to hear from normal people as well. And when I'm in Ukraine over the coming weeks, I will try and um, interview some people. S obviously, there'll be the language barrier, I, so I can only really speak to people who, who speak very good English. Although I can still pe speak to people who uh, speak Russian or Ukrainian and get get an idea of what they um, what they believe uh, by using translators etc I do speak a little Russian and Ukrainian but certainly not to have a good co enough to have a good conversation um, this week I watched um, a documentary the century of the self which I think I may have seen before but maybe not watched properly um, so thanks to Anthony to, for recommending that again I, I didn't watch all of it again it's quite a long I think it was about three hours long, but I did see um, the first hour. It's all about the psychology of the masses and how um, how they're controlled through um, advertising and how they're controlled in general. And um, I think we're going to have a chat now with Anthony about the research he's been doing. Um, I know he's looking at um, crowd control and general control uh, of people using f sonic uh, weapons and things like that, but I th I'm not sure he's going to be talking about that today. We'll we'll have a, we'll find out and have a chat with him. Um, so let's go over to Anthony. Um, so hello, Anthony. Hi, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. <laughs> Just had some technical problems, but we'll hopefully sort that out by next episode. Um, how about yourself? Yeah, yeah. Let's put this on the gag reel at the end of the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And um, what have you been looking? Uh, what have you been looking at this week for us? I know that um, this is a bit off the cuff today because of the problems we've been having. But um, can you go over some of the stuff you've been looking at? Sure. Yeah, it hasn't been difficult to find things to talk about this week, uh, especially here in Turkey. Uh, it's been very interesting, and I and I suspect maybe the shape of things to come because uh, the uncomfortable relationship between the Turkish government and the social media has continued and I guess you could say it's intensified. Right, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about why um, why they banned uh, YouTube in Turkey? Sure, yeah. There's, there's a whole, um, there's a whole, there's been a whole range of things leading up to this, but uh, the trigger was a conversation between four 
high-level ministers in the Turkish government, uh, including the foreign minister, they were talking about uh, circumstances under which Turkey might invade Syria. And the conversation was, uh, the conversation included a suggestion of a false flag operation, you know, finding a pretext to enter Syria. Uh, and this conversation then was leaked, it was recorded, leaked and uploaded onto YouTube. That was on the 27th of March and on that same day the government just decided to block YouTube entirely. And do you know why, why, would, um, why would Turkey want to go to war with Syria? Well, relations between the two have really deteriorated in the last couple of years. I mean, uh, up until the point where Assad got caught out using chemical weapons, uh, the two countries were fairly friendly with each other, but suddenly Turkey started condemning uh, the Syrian regime. Uh, they actually helped to fund and set up an army, a rebel army, to fight the Syrian army. Um, and there have been border skirmishes and all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's also a historical reason. There's a there's a piece of territory inside Syria uh, which contains a tomb of a guy called Suleiman Shah. He was the grandfather of Osman I, who founded the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. And the Turks have always considered that to be Turkish territory, even though it's not inside their borders. Uh, in fact, they, they managed to get uh, France to sign a document to that effect in 1921. But... Uh, yeah, so so there have been some threats to uh, some threats against that particular patch of territory where Turkey has a permanent military presence, and that has just really fanned the fire. Things things have seemed to spin out of control here a little bit lately. Uh, uh, the government, as I said, were were fighting or at least agitating against the regime in Syria, but it's actually anti-government people inside Syria now who are threatening to blow up this tomb. And so, I don't know, Turkey seems to be losing its allies or losing its influence inside the country. And they're, I think, getting a little bit desperate. They don't quite know what to do. The government doesn't quite know what to do about this unfolding situation. So, this current government, anything, uh, whenever it faces a situation that it doesn't fully understand, its reaction is a huge crackdown. What seems to be occurring now? And has there, has there been any more protests on the street by students or anything in the last few weeks? There, there have been isolated uh, incidents. You know, they've had to bring out the water cannon and so on a few times. But at the moment, it's it's fairly quiet. Uh, as I think I mentioned last week, the mood is is one of, of despondency more than more than anger at the moment. Yeah. And talking of uh, water cannons. Um, you were going to come on soon, maybe maybe in next episode or an, an, an upcoming episode, and talk about um, sound cannons or some kind of sound weaponry. Is that right? Yeah, this is really a fascinating topic. Uh, it goes right back to the 60s and 70s when electronic music was starting to come into its own. And there were various people experimenting with the limits to which you could take sound. Uh, and, and what some of these people discovered is that if you manipulated sound in certain ways, uh, it would actually um, uh, go outside of the audible range, you know, because our ears have a very limited range. You know, there are plenty of animals on the earth that can hear stuff that we can't hear. You know? uh -huh. So it started to manipulate sound that was outside the normal range of human hearing, that it could have quite strong physiological effects. Now, unfortunately, uh, as with a lot of things, uh, governments and military organizations have gotten hold of this information. And the result is something called the LRAD and MRAD. So LRAD is long range audio device, MRAD medium range audio device. <coughs> Excuse me. And basically, uh, it's a crowd control tool, but the long term effects on people are unknown. You basically point this, it's a handheld device. You point it at a crowd and it sends a sonic burst at them, which results in them uh, being in intense pain. Uh, so I'm going to have a look a little bit at, at this, uh, the, the basis of this. Uh, I'm, luckily, I'm lucky enough to know somebody who actually managed to buy one on eBay in Australia. <laughs> so you, can, you can buy any, anything on eBay these days, can't you? can literally buy a non-lethal <laughs> uh, police sound device 
on eBay in Australia. So we're going to, I hope, talk to that person and uh, maybe even get a product demonstration. Who knows? Well, that'd be cool. Okay, thanks. Um, well, thanks for a short notice for coming on um, today. Uh, we're probably going to leave it there now. Um, thanks again, and we hope to speak to you next episode, okay? No problem, no problem. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks a lot then. Goodbye. Uh, coming up in future episodes of um, Truth Sentinel will include um, things like the global elite, population control, 9-11, the Illuminati, the Mothman, genetic engineering, um, the coming apop apocalypse, World War III. Um, you know, we'll look at the paranormal also. We'll look at mysteries and um, conspiracies. If you've got any uh, anything or any topics that fit into that um, remit then please let us know in the comments section in the YouTube, under the YouTube videos or uh, you can go to Facebook Scott Sentinel or you can m email us by clicking on YouTube and if you click on the about section there's a bit there where you can click on it and uh, email us um, also remember we're looking for a reviewer to review other shows like Jesse Ventura, Lip TV, David Icke, um, Alex Jones, John B. Wells. Um, some uh, recently I've had less time to actually listen to those because I've been on the move traveling. Um, so it'd be nice to keep in touch with what they're talking about as well. And also just to get reviews of any new people that are cropping up because there's always new people uh, cropping up in the independent media and that's a, that's a really good thing at the moment. Okay, let's just move on to, um, oh, another one I just wanted to mention quickly was Hagman and Hagman. Um, I try and listen to them sometimes. Um, the last one I listened to, the guy was a little bit obsessed with numbers and symbolism. Uh, they had a guest on. Sounded a bit, a bit paranoid, um, and I switched off a bit, to be honest. I, I try to keep an open mind to everything, but if you see patterns of numbers and everything I think you could go slightly mad I wasn't blown away by the details anyway that he was talking about uh, Hagman and Hagman uh, tend to have on uh, they have quite a religious slant so if you don't like that kind of stuff it's probably not for you um, I was raised in, a, raised in a fairly religious family so I'm fairly comfortable with it I mentioned on um, the last episode that we're going to have um, maybe a weather section sports section an economic market section. Well, I've had a lot of um, a lot of technical problems today, so I'm going to have to. Today's episode's a bit more going to be a bit more rambly, really. Um, but we'll hopefully go back to a decent f um, sort of more organised format after we've got over these technical problems. Um, let me just talk a little bit about Harp. Just an introductory um, chat about Harp. Basically. Um, what does HARP stand for? Let's um, let's have a look at that. Well, it stands for High Frequency Active Aurora Research Program, which was um, which is part of the U.S. military defense program, and it's um, generated quite a lot of controversy over the last decade or so because some people say it's being used for weather modification. And some people say it's got secret electromagnetic warfare capabilities as well. But people are saying that it could possibly have caused earthquakes, tsunami or disrupted global communication systems. There's a lot of secrecy around HARP, um, allegedly for reasons of national security. Although most of the time when, when those reasons are given, it's not actually true. It's because they're trying to hide something that, we, that people aren't going to like. I mean, according to the HARP website, it's a scientific in endeavour aimed at studying the properties and behaviour of their ionosphere, which makes you wonder, well, why does it have to be secret then? Um, the ionosphere is a delica delicate upper layer of our atmosphere, and um, with it being so delicate, do we really want people playing around with it, shooting electromagnetic beams up there uh, without us knowing why? Or having any say in the matter. I mean, they're basically firing pulse-directed energy beams in, in order to temporarily excite a limited area of the ionosphere. 
And, you know, if you start tampering around with nature like that, then you don't know what kind of results uh, there's going to be. At least they should be held accountable for these actions and we should know what they're doing. And here's an excerpt from the History Channel documentary Harp Weather Modification, The Military's Mystery Machine. Please um, relax, listen to this excerpt, and then we'll wind down today's episode. It's no coincidence that the United States began building its own mysterious array of antennas in February 1992. They are located in Gakona, Alaska. The project is called HARP. HARP is the high-frequency active auroral research project, originally a joint effort of the Air Force and Navy in cooperation with a number of academic institutions. It is today the world's largest radio broadcasting station, but it's not designed to broadcast for human ears. It uses unique patented ability to focus the energy coming out of the antenna field and injects that energy into a spot at the very top of the atmosphere in a region called the ionosphere. HARP is comprised of 180 antennas, approximately 72 feet tall, linked together to function as one giant steerable antenna. Steerable because it can aim millions of watts of ELF waves into one tiny patch of the atmosphere. The amount of energy we're talking about here is 3.6 million watts. To give you an idea of what that is, the largest legal AM radio station in North America is 50,000 watts. HARP is 72,000 50,000 watt radio stations injecting their entire output into a spot that's about 12 miles across by about two and a half miles deep by about 90 miles up. This is where HARP is pointing. It's an area located roughly 300 miles from Anchorage. The U.S. military says HARP is merely being used to study the physical and electrical properties and behavior of the ionosphere for both civilian and defense purposes. But another theory has surfaced. The intense energy being beamed into the sky by HARP is actually heating up the atmosphere, causing weather changes. HARP is being used for weather modification. The military's own record proves it. They've admitted it within their own documents and yet they still deny it to the public. Dr. Brooks Agnew has researched ELF wave technology for the past 30 years and is convinced HARP's effect on the ionosphere does alter the weather. HARP couldn't affect the jet stream directly, but indirectly it could, because if you push the ionosphere out into space, then the stratosphere just under the ionosphere has to move to fill in that gap. When it moves, it could pull the jet stream with it, thus rerouting it hundreds of miles, changing the way water moves through our atmosphere. Dr. Agnew has devised a demonstration to show how HARP could manipulate the atmosphere. So what we've done is we've got a cloud generator up here. It's an ultrasonic nebulizer. It's going to create real water particles, just like you would find in a cloud. What we're seeing now is we're actually filling this chamber with uh, microscopic water particles. You can see that it's almost completely filled with water vapor. It's beginning to condense a little bit on the sides. Just so that you can see the detail, we've got a nice dense fog, just like you were sitting inside a cloud at 50,000 feet. At the bottom of the cloud chamber, Dr. Agnew has constructed an ELF wave transmitter, a miniature version of HARP. We're only using 100 watts. It's perfectly safe. When Dr. Agnew turns on the ELF wave transmitter and begins shooting ELF waves into the simulated cloud, the cloud begins to move up to the top of the chamber, taking the moisture with it. If you get down low enough, you can actually see a clear layer above the antenna. It is actually pushing these water particles up. And that's exactly how HARP works. What we've done is we've not only pushed the cloud off of the HARP antenna, but as you can see, our cloud is almost completely gone inside. HARP does exactly the same thing. It, it ionizes the particles, pushes them out into space. HARP is one of several ELF wave transmitters located all over the globe. The United States owns and operates three of them. One in Gakona, Alaska, 
another in Fairbanks, Alaska, and one in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Russia has one in Vasilursky, near Nizhny, Novgorod, and the European Union has one near Trumsa in Norway. Working in tandem, these transmitters could potentially alter the weather anywhere in the world, changing the jet stream's course entirely, triggering massive rainstorms or droughts. Even hurricane steering would be possible by heating up the atmosphere and building up high-pressure domes that could deflect or change the course of hurricanes. The U.S. government is firm in its position that HARP is just an atmospheric research facility. But is it more than coincidence that since going online, some experts have reported strange weather anomalies, including massive floods, hurricanes, and earthquakes? HARP went online in 1994, and construction continued until 2007. There are reportedly a total of five known ionospheric heaters, including HARP, in the world today. There are possibly 20 other ionospheric heaters in existence all over the world. There is no conclusive proof that any of them are being used as weather weapons, though they do have the ability to manipulate the ionosphere. And that brings us to something else. December 2001. Scientists at NASA's Ames Research Center in Palo Alto, California, make a discovery. In studying more than 100 earthquakes with magnitudes of 5.0 or greater, they find that almost all of them are preceded by electrical disturbances in the ionosphere. Could there be a connection to HARP or a facility like it? To say that HARP can artificially excite the ionosphere in such a way to cause an earthquake, well, it alarms me. Dr. Agnew experienced the power of ELF waves firsthand back in the 1980s. He was hired by an energy company to locate oil and gas using the same kind of ELF waves at much lower frequencies to carry out his search. It's a process called Earth tomography. Anyway, let's move on. Um, we're going to be coming to a close soon. Just, um, just to let you know that um, we're always on the lookout for sponsors, for advertisers. Um, basically people who want to advertise on here. If it's something related to what we're talking about or any of the topics in, in any way, then, then we may consider uh, advertisements. But really, we're not just going to have advertisements about soap powder or anything like that, so don't worry. Uh, I think it's going to be a long time before we have adverts on here anyway. Um, basically, it's probably time now to say thanks again for listening. Um, for the positive comments you've left in the um, comments section of YouTube. And um, I hope that we can all meet again in a week's time and that I'll have some information for you on the ground from Ukraine. Okay, thanks again. Bye.